Good morning and happy Easter. Good morning, Easter. Happy Easter. My name is Reagan Miskelly. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And on behalf of our First United Methodist Church family, I want to welcome all of our guests here in the place. Church family, let us welcome them. One of the reasons that we are so excited that you are taking part in our Easter celebration is because we believe that indeed an Easter hope was released some 2,000 years ago and the world has never been the same since. You see, one of the unique aspects about Christianity is that we can actually date our origin to the very time, to the very moment, to the very particular place in which it began. Now, other religions cannot do this. Judaism doesn't, Buddhism, Islam doesn't, not even atheism does this. You see, the reasons Jesus' death is to be celebrated is because indeed this day we are reminded of what comes after death. And that is the fact that Christ is risen. And he is risen indeed. Amen. And yet the sad thing is for so many is that they don't believe that there is anything more. In fact, they believe that death is all that there is. I came across some recent research about the funeral industry. And an interesting truth about us is that we don't like to think about death much in our culture. But the truth of the matter is that one day all of us will face death. And when we do, it'll probably cost a lot of money. There's been a new market that has been created specifically for baby boomers. Baby boomers want to go out of this world in style, and so they have begun to create what are known as designer caskets. These caskets can run all the way up to $25,000. You see, uh, these days you don't have to settle with just a typical coffin. In fact, uh, there are university caskets that can be customized in the colors of your alma mater, complete with your school logo. And the first time these were ever released, the first time they took order for these, was actually at Ohio State University's homecoming. Talk about a new meaning for homecoming, right? (laughs) Also, if you indeed are a football fan, you can have for yourself an NFL casket that is decked out in your favorite football team, complete with a flat screen TV that will actually show a a video of one of your favorite team's game during your visitation, okay? So there you have it. Also, there is a hunter casket complete with a deer's head or a duck's face. See, some of y'all are making plans right now as I'm talking. (laughs) There is also a uh, gone fishing casket. And then one of my absolute favorite is a return to cinder casket, right? So whether it is faith, farming, firefighting, fireworks, even football, if you are passionate about it, then indeed you can have a -a one-of-a-kind custom designed uh, casket created for you. Now again, I don't know if there has ever been a culture that has spent more money on death and less attention to what comes after death. But this hasn't always been the case. In fact, there have been generations before us that have actually taught children a very familiar prayer. And when I begin it, you're going to know. So say it along with me. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Not a real cheery prayer, right? (laughs) To teach the children. But you may not know that there's actually another verse that continues. And it has these words. Our days begin with trouble here. Our life is but a span. And cruel death is always near. So frail a thing is man. (laughs) Night, night, honey. (laughs) 
pleasant dreams. You see, one of the reasons that people used to teach their children to pray this is because people wanted their children to know that death is real. But what we are reminded of this very day is that death indeed is not the end. Have any of y'all heard of the name Mel Blanc? Okay, great, we got some here. Not Mont Blanc, not the pen, Mel Blanc. Some of you that may not know him are probably familiar with his work and you just don't know it. He is actually the man that does the voices behind all of the Looney Tunes cartoons. And in fact, one of his most famous works is what happened at the end of every cartoon and it was this. Take a look. That's all, folks. Now, sadly, back in 1989, Mel Blanc died. And does anybody want to take a guess what his family put on his tombstone? <laughs> That's all, folks. And you see, this is the question that we come with this morning. We come wrestling with the question, is this Easter message true? Did Jesus indeed rise from the dead? Did he defeat death? Or is that all, folks, when it comes to our living and when it comes to our dying? Does it mean that the show is now over? Or does it mean that the real show is just beginning? You see, in our day, many people think that the resurrection is indeed good news. But they may wonder if, is it true news. In order for us to answer this question, we have to return to the first century and their understanding, unique understanding, of what happened after someone died. Now again, in the first century ancient culture, they had a myriad of opinions of what happened after death, similar to how we do today. One idea was that uh, when you live and when you die, your life goes out simply like a candle like a puff of smoke. At one point you're here and then you were gone. In fact, one of the most famous epitaphs that were put on tombstones at the time that was translated in both Aramaic and Greek had these words. I was not, I was. I am not, I don't care. Would you want that on your tombstone, right? I mean, it's kind of even hard to fathom, but yes, that was incredibly popular in the first century. Others believed that there was a place where departed spirits went, a place that was known as Hades. Now, Hades was considered to be a life where you would have this shadowy existence after you died. When you went to Hades, you did not return. It was clear that Hades, indeed, was a one-way ticket. And then there is this idea of resurrection. This idea of resurrection was actually before even Jesus. The Greeks thought of resurrection. They didn't believe that it was going to happen. But you see, there was a little bit of problem. Because just as we think of resurrection in regards of eternal life, they looked around them and they saw that the world was an absolute mess. They saw heartache. They saw hatred, they saw destruction and war and discord. And they said, what good is it going to do any of us if we spend life eternally and everything around us is an absolute mess? And so there was this idea in ancient Israel that the God of the universe would one day come back. And not only would he redeem and restore the righteous from dead and bring them back to life, but indeed he would redeem all of, of, of creation. You see, when this happened, not only would people be forgiven of their sin, but he would establish justice and end suffering and he would heal creation. And again, when this occurred, it was going to be dramatic, obvious, undeniable and done on a massive scale. It was believed that when this occurred, it was served as the end of time. They believed in the, in the resurrection. It's not just an afterlife, but it is a God-perfected, God-redeemed, God-set-right kind of life. And because of this belief, 
Nobody in Israel would ever think to claim that an individual by the name of Jesus was actually resurrected in the very middle of history. Do you see the tension? Because when the people heard this, they would look around and say, well, okay, has disease been eradicated? Has justice broken out? Has suffering ended? I mean, this would have appeared to have been absolute nonsense. And then comes this man, Jesus, who his followers believe absolutely is the Messiah, that he's going to overthrow Rome, that he's going to bring about what he refers to as the kingdom of God here on earth, and then all of a sudden, he dies. And with that, the hopes and the dreams of his followers as well. You see, never in Scripture, even though Jesus prophesied that this was going to happen, when he dies, never do his followers say, well, everything's going just according to plan. In fact, all four Gospels present a very different portrait of the disciples. They all paint a portrait in which they are disheartened, dismayed, disillusioned, dispirited, and then all of a sudden they're not. All of a sudden, something so radical has happened that they are convicted with everything that they have that Jesus indeed has risen. The same band of followers that when he was crucified went and hid are now walking and shouting from the streets that the power of the resurrection in this one named Jesus is indeed real. Now, some people think that we are skeptical about the resurrection because we're modern, because we're smart, we're educated, because we have science. And that in ancient days, people were simply gullible and willing to believe anything that they wanted. C.S. Lewis calls this chronological snobbery. He said that ancient people were not stupid. In fact, they understood that dead creatures tend to stay dead. There's a story that Ken Davis writes about uh, a woman who one day sees her German shepherd with the neighbor's bunny in its mouth, shaking it violently back and forth. Now, what you need to know is that this neighbor, this woman and her, and her neighbor did not have a good relationship. And so this was not going to help their relationship at all. So she runs out and she begins to pummel the dog until the dog finally releases what is now a very dead bunny. She panics and has no idea what she should do. So she gathers up the bunny, she takes it into her house, she actually bathes the bunny and cleans the bunny up, she hair dries the bunny's fluffy hair. Then she goes on to comb the bunny. The bunny has never looked better. And so then she sneaks into her neighbor's backyard. And she puts the bunny nicely and neatly into the bunny's cage. She goes back home and a couple uh, hours later, she hears her neighbor screaming. Ah! Ah! She runs out and says, what is it? What is it? She says, our rabbit! Our rabbit! Our rabbit died three weeks ago. We buried it and now it's back! <laughs> you see, people in the ancient world would know the dead rabbits stay dead. They would also know that dead rabbis stay dead as well. The gospel writers are very clear that they did not know what was going on. In fact, it took them time in order to put the pieces together and to understand the true miracle that had just taken place. We see two central things that happen in our text this morning that continue to prove not only is the resurrection story a good story, but it is a true story. The first thing is that it began with an empty tomb. Mark 16, 6 says that he is not here. 
see the place where they have laid him. The second thing is that Jesus appeared to his followers. Mark continues, he's going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. Now, it is the combination of these two factors together that provide us with some overwhelming evidence. One without the other just simply wouldn't work. For example, if we had an empty tomb and Jesus did not appear to his followers, then people would simply have assumed that this is just a case of grave robbery. On the other hand, if we had Jesus appearing to his followers and yet the body still remained into, in the tomb, then people would say, oh, Jesus' followers are just hallucinating. They're just having visions. But you see, the body wasn't there. And Rome was experiencing such heat that if they had a body that they could have found and presented, they would have done it. And you know the reason that they didn't present a body? is because the body wasn't there. That he had indeed risen. He had risen in such powerful ways. And something happened to the disciples, and this began to sink in. It actually began to transform the very community in which they lived. They began to put the pieces together, realizing that Jesus' resurrection didn't just affect Jesus, it affected them. That they were the ones who were dead in their sin. That they were the ones who'd been separated from God. And that somehow, when Jesus hung on the cross and was dead and buried, that God orchestrated this movement of redemption, of the forgiveness of sins, of this understanding of new life, and this experience of this Easter hope. You see, Paul echoes a similar sentiment in 1 Corinthians when he writes, Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this is what we're celebrating this morning. This is why we gather to remember the ultimate resurrection story. Because when someone puts their trust in Jesus and they face death, what they know with absolute certainty is that's not all folks. You see, there's a story about two men that are in a museum. And they come upon a painting that depicts a chess game. There are two characters in, their, in this painting. There's a young man and there's the devil. Now, the young man is down to all but one chess piece on the board. And the title of this painting is called Checkmate. That day, one of the men that were perusing the museum was actually an international chess champion. And he approaches this painting. And there's something about the painting that intrigues him. He begins to study the painting and the person that's with him begins to get agitated and says, there's something about this that bothers me. Go on ahead, enjoy the museum, and when you're done, come back. Sure enough, the chess champion sits down. And in a matter of moments, his head begins to bounce, and he begins to move his hands as if he's moving imaginary chess pieces. When his friend comes back, he says, we've got to find the artist of this painting. He said, what's wrong? He says, either he needs to add to this painting or he needs to change the title of the painting. It doesn't need to be called Checkmate. He said, well, why is that? He grew so animated and so agitated that he asked for actually a chess board to be brought in. He set it up right in front of the painting. He put the pieces exactly where the painting had them distributed. And he said, this isn't checkmate for the devil. He said, this young man has one more move. In fact, it's his king. The king has one more move. And if the king moves, he can win the game entirely. You see, I don't know where you are spiritually this morning. 
I don't know what it is that you're struggling with. I don't know what it is within your own soul and heart that you wrestle and even what is in within you this morning that might be dead that needs to be resurrected by the power of cross. But brothers and sisters, hear me this morning. When it comes to your life, the king has one more move. There's a man by the name of David who faces a giant named Goliath and it looks like checkmate, but hold on because the king has one more move. There's a man by the name of Daniel who is faithful and loves to pray. He's told that if he keeps praying, then he's going to find himself in a lion's den. He gets arrested. He gets thrown in. It looks like all the authorities are going to see that he no longer is alive. But in the morning, guess what? He is. And do you know why? Because the king has one more move. There's a guy by the name of Moses who finds himself with the Red Sea before him and finds Pharaoh pursuing him from behind. It looks like it's over. It looks like it's done. It looks like it's checkmate, but hold on because the king has got one more move. You see, on Friday, they tried him. They judged him. They whipped him. They rebuked him. They flogged him. They scorned him, and they hung him on a cross. And when he died, they brought him low into the earth. And when they did... The devil celebrated, the Roman authorities, the religious leaders said, the show is over. That's all, folks. Checkmate. But three days later, guess what? The king had one more move. And so, brothers and sisters, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what today brings you here. But hear me now that when it comes to your life, the show is not over. That's not all, folks. Because in the face of a resurrected king of kings and lord of lords, the king has got one more move. And the one more move has got your name on it. To be redeemed, to be justified, to be found as one of God's own. And so brothers and sisters, may you rise up and testify to the glory of God at work in this place. And claim as your own this Easter hope. For indeed... Christ is risen, and he is risen indeed. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. And Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.